Manitoba has the highest rate of kids in care in Canada, that's foster care, most of whom are Indigenous. The system is by all accounts broken. Kids are sometimes taken into care with little or no grounds. Kids who are indeed neglected or are abused are often warehoused with strangers instead of with family, or they're bounced from foster home to foster home or group home. Caseworkers have so many open files here that they can't keep adequate track of what's even happening with kids in their care. Yet that doesn't seem to stop them from taking more. And and then there's the for-profit foster homes that are in the headlines for not noticing kids that are abusing other kids. Plus, strangers get more money for fostering kids than family members do for fostering. The tragic list goes on and on and on. programs are so underfunded that Indigenous parents actually have to give their children away to provincial foster care in order to get help. There's something fundamentally wrong. devolution uh, to these agencies whereby we, we replaced one broken bureaucracy with 28 broken bureaucracies. 28 broken bureaucracies might explain how 11,000 kids are taken from their families every year in Manitoba, 90% of whom are Indigenous and are taken by Indigenous agencies. Of course, some children legitimately need protection, but a great many aren't taken from unsafe or neglectful homes. But, uh, there is no accountability. There, we have so many agencies, so many individual actors, the, the, even the basic processes or standards that would be in place, which would put the best interests of children at the centre, are not being followed. And there's incentive to take children. These agencies are funded based on the number of kids in care. That's how the province funds them. More kids equals more money from the government. Kids in care means jobs. It means jobs for social workers, judges, legal aid lawyers, agency staff, authorities who oversee this industry. It's lots of jobs. And what the Legislative Review Committee found was that people in Manitoba were starting to question this multi-million dollar system. Collectively, we still are the worst jurisdiction in North America when it comes to the care of children. Mm -hmm. What we heard from over 1,500 Manitobans by and large is, is that what the system is saying uh, and what uh, the reality is for children uh, within the system, there's a, there's a disconnect. I don't believe that would be anyone's intention, but that is the reality and the outcome for thousands of children, sadly, within our province. Yeah. The reality for most kids that are involved with the system, they end up becoming permanent wards yeah. and they end up staying in the system until they're 18. Many of them tragically carry on to the court system. The government seems to have not figured out that it doesn't have a great track record at raising kids. And the Legislative Review Committee found that the government doesn't even know how many kids it's raising. Somewhere between 10 and 11,000 a year is the ballpark. We don't even know those numbers. We can keep track of numbers within other Crown corporations, but within child welfare, 
government struggles to even identify the number of kids in care or the number of times those children are being moved or being split up from their uh, siblings. This system is so eager for more kids, they'll take them out of a mother's arms within hours of birth if they can. It's known as birth alerts. If you've been in care or if your kids are or were in care, your health file is flagged so that if you have a baby, the hospital calls a CFS agency immediately. And within hours, you'll get a visit from a child protection worker. They often apprehend babies from the hospital. The Manitoba Children's Advocate says on average, they take one newborn a day in Manitoba. The Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry called for an end to birth alerts as science shows that it causes irreparable harm to both mother and child. So far, BC is the only province to have ended birth alerts. Elsewhere, these alerts have created a subculture of families operating under the government radar. Women are having children in, in secret. secret. Uh, foster parents, other you know, that are forming relationships with birth mothers are doing that in secret. There, there's underground railroads being created to keep kids out of this system. There's annexes to hide children from this system. Yeah. Reminds you of other atrocities in human history. Yeah. And it's here it, today well, in 2019. Have, have Critics say the residential school era never ended. It just morphed into the 60s scoop, which then morphed into what's being called uh, the millennium scoop, and that continues today. We know that the separation of children from familiar caregivers from mothers and fathers creates brain damage, yeah. uh, yet we can't seem to work together in a way, in fact, we're, th we're often threatened by, and funding mechanisms are set up in a way that incentivizes that removal and continued move, uh, moving of children. The Legislative Review Committee recommended sweeping changes. So this document recommended legislative reform. So, you know, to change the posture from one of, you know, government's got this, we're here to protect and not just protect. There are going to be times, sadly, where protection is required. For sure. Uh, but when there is intervention required, there must be accountability. In this world, to many families, there doesn't seem to be any avenue of appeal or any accountability on the forces and institutions that are apprehending children and splitting children up and moving them at record numbers. What led Manitoba to become kind of the worst, not kind of, the worst uh, jurisdiction for child welfare in this country just based on per capita numbers? Uh, well, here, let's take a look.
mother I lived with didn't really let me use the stove because she didn't feel like I was uh, ready to use it. I guess she cared about my safety, right? But uh, then again, you know, it could have been helpful for me to be able to use the stove early on so I know how to cook and feel more confident. We gotta go this way. Hi, my name is Troy and I just staged out of CFS Care.
57 cents compared to the chicken. Save two cents. I love noodles because I feel like a college student. Sometimes I feel like that's the only thing I can eat. <laughs> if I had a full-time job, even on minimum wage, I'd probably get more than EIA gives me right now. I'd be able to pay my rent and have enough money to save. Like, I'd probably be able to save 40 bucks a month. <sighs> Troy Bird has spent most of his life in foster care, aging out at 21. I feel like I've lost a lot of foster kids, including myself, have lost that connection to their traditional side. He said his own experience wasn't bad, but what does disturb him, the overwhelming number of Indigenous children in care. It's sad when you look at all the Indigenous youth being taken away from families and being put in the homes before, you know, the parents are given a chance to work to keep the children. I was brought into CFS care when I was about 10 months old. My pediatrician when I was a kid said I had some form of autism. I got FASD, I'm trying to think of the other ones. I got, sometimes I get extreme anxiety. That house right there, the corner right there, the greenhouse, the greenhouse right there. That's the house I lived at right there. That's it. I started living here when I was 13. And then I moved out when I was 18. In Canada, just over 7% of all children are Indigenous, but they make up more than 52% of kids in care. In Manitoba, the rate is even higher, about 90%.
Hello, Max. I'm from the Dakota Teepee First Nation. I was um, born in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, and I was put in care at the age of uh, three weeks. Um, it was in the prairies. I, was, I lived on a farm. There were approximately eight kids in there. Uh, four of the foster families and four uh, children that were in care, foster care, which was which was me. Um, I was brought back, picked up and brought home overnight by a, a white couple who were British background. And uh, I've been in Brampton most of my life. Um, had a good upbringing, had a, you know, good values, good education, um, but there was always that one thing missing, and that was spirituality. And that was something that my, my adopt parents could, didn't know about. They didn't, they didn't understand it. And that's what's something I had to go back into my own home community and figure out what it was. And a lot of our kids go through that. They end up in counseling because they're trying to find out that, that one important piece.
When I was about four years old, my mom, um, something happened in my home with me and my sibling, and uh, it caused my mom to go through a lot of grief, and she had to give me up to, uh, she had to call child welfare and tell them she couldn't handle me anymore. And I understand that now. She wasn't ready for the amount of children that she had at the time, which was only four or three, but still yet. She, she wasn't ready for me, and that's okay because I have to understand. Morn is from Enoch Cree Nation, just west of Edmonton. He became a permanent ward of the province two decades ago. And he had a new foster mother at just four years old. It didn't take long for the abuse to start. I was abused sexually by her boyfriend uh, for about, till I was nine years old. And it almost happened quite frequently, almost every week. but. Um, she, she was okay, she didn't know, but I know her to this day, she's a good lady. After he began to act out, he was moved from that home. But not before his abuser warned him to keep his mouth shut. The last time I seen him in person, he, uh, he told me in the shower as he was doing his last, his last whatever you want to call it on me, and uh, he, after he was done, he told me, and I quote, it'll this is will forever be engraved into my memory, and I quote, if you ever tell anyone about the things I have done to you, I will find you and I will kill you. Morn then ping-ponged between foster parents and group homes. He told a worker at one of those group homes about the abuse when he was 12. They ended up like getting some, I don't know, investigators and nothing was done about it. It was a waste of time. I gave my statements, I was, I was 12 years old. Nothing was done about it. After I left that place, after being there for so many days, you know, going back and forth, um, you know, I stopped, they stopped bringing me there and eventually I was like, that was it. He says he received no counseling for his trauma. Worse, he felt let down by the system that was supposed to protect him. I feel like they didn't want it to get out and what happened to me and for many years and uh, they didn't do their job and that would come back on them. So what I felt like was that they passed me around to different homes, you know, to make me forget of what happened. and. Uh, then eventually I went into different group homes after nine years old, from home to home, school to school. It was crazy, man. I'm a part of what they called the Millennial Scoop. It just hasn't stopped. Shane Oski, who spent years in care, says there needs to be more physical and financial support. Just housing subsidies, because BC Housing is so overrun, and how is a person supposed to create stability for their child in order for them to feel permanency if they have to keep moving because of the cost of rent? I feel like With extra support, she says, families to might be able to stay know. together in the first place.
Clinton John Marty lives here with his wife Carrie Lynn. They live on the Elizabeth Métis settlement in Alberta, just south of Cold Lake. Marty and his brother were put into a Catholic home in Edmonton. I was thrown into at six years old uh, with uh, boys as old as 12 years old. Um, and from that day forward, the abuse uh, in the form of sexual, physical, and mental abuse uh, started and continued right up until uh, we left. That home was supposed to be a stopgap until a foster home was found. Marty was sent to at least 17 homes and group homes. Between each stop, he was placed back into the Catholic home where the abuse continued. It started out with the boys, um, other boys. Um, it also was uh, staff certain staff members had a fondness for us, um, the nuns. At eight years old, um, there was a sister there, I'm not going to name her name, she may be alive still today, but she would select from some of the older boys to come into her room. They had a single room, much smaller than my camper, with a bed, a nightstand, a sink and a little closet. And there they would select a boy to go in and have oral sex with them. And once we were done, we were brought back to our bed and told not to say anything. That performing oral sex on them? Yes, yes, on the sisters. Yes. That was my first experience ever with a female at the age of nine years old, right? Eight, nine years old. 
Marty says one priest abused boys and offered them extra food. The abuse was reported um, on many occasions. Who did you report? You reported to the social worker. There was two of them that were there uh, Monday to Friday, um, nine to five, and they were in charge of all of the kids that were in there. And so you'd tell so-and-so a staff or a, a sister that you wanted to go down and see uh, your social worker. And so you would tell them and nine times out of 10, they didn't believe you. Um, they classify you as a troubled kid. We were replaced in a receiving home. And in that receiving home, on our last month in care, we were molested by the adopted, the foster family's son, the oldest son. Um, physical and sexual abuse. And by this time, I'm almost 12 years old. I'm understanding everything more so that's going on. And you learn to fight back. I learned to fight 12-year-old boys at 8 years old. Clinton says his mother told Alberta Child Protection not to give him or his brother to his biological father. She did not trust him. They did anyway. He was one of our abusers. Child welfare was told never to give us to our father. And child welfare placed us with him not once but twice. And he abused us sexually, physically, and very emotionally. Um, and he was charged for that. And he never faced the charges because he committed suicide so that he didn't have to. And so we lived with that as well. never felt safe or protected in my position, especially within the House of Commons. Often having pep talks with myself in the elevator or taking a moment in the bathroom stall to maintain my composure. When I walk through these doors, not only am I reminded of the clear colonial house on fire I am willingly walking into, I am already in survival mode. Since being elected, I expect to be stopped by security at my workplace. I've had security jog after me down hallways, nearly put their hands on me and racial profile me as a member of parliament. People don't like me don't belong here in the federal institution. I'm a human being who wants to use this institution to help people, but the reality is that this institution and the country has been created off the backs, trauma and displacement of indigenous people. Even if we're told we should run, we still face huge barriers. Young people have been told they are not experienced enough, not ready to lead. Women have been told to sit pretty and listen. Disabled individuals have been shown they aren't even worth the conversations and Inuit kill themselves at the highest rate in the country. We are facing a suicide epidemic and this institution refuses to care. During my time in this chamber, I have heard so many pretty words like reconciliation, diversity, and inclusion. I have been called courageous, brave, and strong by people outside of my party. But let me be honest, brutally honest, nice words with no action hurt when they are uttered by those with power over the federal institution and refuse to take action. There is nothing, nothing to take pride in, in the legacy this institution continues to not only maintain, but to build and fuel. Maybe it is impossible for ministers to understand what we go through every day, but I am urging you, telling you to listen, believe us, and do something about it. When we tell you to act now, you need to act now. And if you understand, then shame on you. Because if you understand how much this hurts, you understand how deep it cuts. It would be easier for me 
to be told that I am wrong and that you disagree than to be told I am right and I'm courageous, but there is no room in your budget for basic, basic human rights that so many others take for granted. Our history is stained with blood, children, youth, adults, and elders' blood. It's time to face the scale of justice. On one side, we have a mountain of suffering, and whenever the government gives us a grain of sand of support, they seem to think the trauma from our past has been rectified, that somehow they deserve a pat on the back. But it will take a mountain of support to even begin the healing process. As long as these halls echo with empty promises instead of real action, I will not belong here. I believe that we are living through a shift in this country where Canadians are starting to wake up to the reality. I'm looking forward to a time where people like me could belong here. A time we can be here. I hope another young or Inuk or woman or all three will follow in my footsteps and continue pushing this institution to support Indigenous peoples in Canada.
Um, I don't think people understand. Like people who are outside of the system think that there's a there's a perception that well, if they have your kids, you've done something, or they have some evidence that you've done something. People have no idea. Unless you're in the system, you know that there's they, these people have more power than police. You don't need a warrant for any of this. You can just say, "I don't know. I feel like there's a there's a, a risk," and you can take people's kids.